Do you know what the best thing about this phone is? The new Galaxy S23 Ultra and its little brothers. It's not the upgraded camera, the better selfie or the slightly better battery life. It is the fact that this uses a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 everywhere. Here in the UK and in Europe and other places, we've always had Samsung's Exynos chips, which have been fine. We've always felt a little short changed. I'm happy to report everywhere we get Snapdragon with the Gen 2. So this is the S23 Ultra. Is it any good? Is it worth upgrading to? Well, it all depends on what phone you're using right now and whether you have a cool 1250 pounds laying about or whatever frightening monthly payments this will go for. But if you are due an upgrade, you're probably not gonna be disappointed. The S23 Ultra not only packs in the new 8 Gen 2 chip, but we also get a new 200 megapixel main camera with a new sensor and the promise of much improved low light photos and video. The selfie has been upgraded as well, although actually it's gone down in megapixels, but it should actually be a step up. And in fact, all three S23 phones share the exact same 12 megapixel selfie camera and they all benefit from the smarter processing we get with the new chip. The design has been slightly tweaked, although you'd be hard pressed to notice. One little change is that the curved edge on the screen is now less curved, or at least the curve doesn't start until closer to the edge, which I think is a smart design because you get a little bit more usable space before you fall off the edge, so to speak, which is particularly helpful if you're drawing with the S Pen. Also, it might just be me, but it feels even more boxy. I mean, the Ultra is just the new Note in all but name with the squared off corners, the S Pen, the best specs. And some people love this design, but it is big, especially if you put a case on it. And depending on how you hold it, I find the corners can jab into my hand a little bit. I prefer the rounded edges of the regular S23 and the Plus. The S23 has also used Gorilla Glass Victors 2 on the front and back, promising better long-term durability and also using more sustainable materials. And of course, no new phone launch will be complete without a couple of new colors. More options usually turn up on Samsung's website after launch, and I will leave my affiliate link to the website in the description below if you fancy having a look. So design-wise, not much has changed really, uh, to the point where this is actually the old one. This is the S22 Ultra. I haven't got my new review sample just yet, uh, but same design, near enough, same S Pen, stereo speakers, same dual SIM, uh, although no micro SD card support. It's all very familiar and it may be a little bit controversial, but I think if Apple get a bunch of flack for not really changing the design significantly, I feel like Samsung should maybe get that as well. Although the Ultra's smaller brothers, the regular S23 and the Plus, have had a bigger design revamp, dropping the camera module, leaving just the lenses like the Ultra. So there's definitely more design continuity now between the three. The screen hasn't really changed either, or at least not as far as you'd be able to tell. It's still rocking the big and still very lovely 6.8 inch Quad HD 120Hz AMOLED with the same and still impressive 1750 nit peak brightness, which is great, but it doesn't quite match the 2000 nits you can get on the iPhone 14 Pro series. However, as someone who uses the Pro and Pro Max regularly, I can tell you that 2000 nits only lasts for like 10 seconds before it overheats and starts getting dimmer. So in practice, there really isn't gonna be that much between them. The only changes this year is the use of LTPO3 tech. So the dynamic one to 120 Hz refresh is a little bit quicker and more efficient, saving a bit of battery. And I'm also told the actual material of the screen is also more energy efficient as well. I am a little bit disappointed that we still don't get any Dolby Vision HDR support on the new S23s. Some rival phones are offering it, although I can't really talk about that just yet. Uh, and we are expecting a Netflix update to support Dolby Vision on mobile very soon. Fair enough, it's a Samsung device and like their TVs, which also don't support Dolby Vision, it's kind of to be expected, but it is a bit of a shame, especially given how big and lovely the screen is and how you're probably gonna wanna watch some movies on this. Let's talk about battery life, because while the other two S23s have had a 200 milliamp hour bump in battery, capacity, the Ultra sticks with the same 5,000 mAh cell, which is absolutely fine and not really surprising given the constraints of having to leave room for the S Pen inside. And I would be surprised if the S23 Ultra didn't last a little bit longer than before thanks to the more efficient screen and the 8 Gen 2 chip, but I'll test this properly in my full review. Another year goes by and there is still no change to charging. The S23 supports 25 watts and the Plus and the Ultra up to 45 watts. You have to buy that separately, of course. But like Apple, Samsung really is just falling behind the Android rivals in terms of fast charging speeds. Although, of course, we do get wireless charging and reverse, which is nice, but I would like to see a bit of an upgrade in terms of charging speed. However, where the S23 Ultra is definitely not lagging behind is in terms of performance and the camera. LPDDR5X RAM, either 8 or 12 gigs of the stuff, plus the faster UFS4 storage with 256 and 512 gig and one terabyte options. 
Now, I haven't had a chance to benchmark this just yet, and I don't know why I'm holding that because it's the old one. Uh, test the new version properly, but with my experience of other 8 Gen 2 powered phones, I can tell you it is actually a significant upgrade in terms of performance, energy efficiency, battery has been better so far, and also the camera. It's surprising just how much difference this new chip, particularly this new chip in the Samsung phone, is having to the camera. For gaming, you can expect to max out Genshin Impact and never drop below 60, although at this level it becomes more about sustained performance and can the cooling system keep up. That's something I'll definitely be testing. Samsung have actually teamed up with Qualcomm for some special Galaxy optimizations here, including boosting the CPU clock speed, uh, 3.2 up to 3.36 gigahertz, adding their latest ultrasonic fingerprint sensor, and more advanced camera processing thanks to their Snapdragon Sight AI. The only surprise is that the new chip supports Wi-Fi 7, but the new phones don't. Samsung's disabled it, or at least for now. Possibly we'll see it on the new Galaxy Fold 5 later in the year, and to be fair, there are only a handful of 7 routers out there anyway, so it's really on the sort of cutting edge of tech, but, you know, it's £1,250, the chip supports it, why not? And finally, let's talk about this camera, because this is what I'm most excited about with the Ultra. And while on the outside, it's a familiar quad lens setup with the main ultra wide and those two telephoto cameras for some hilarious and slightly creepy results at up to 100 times zoom. But what is different this year is the main camera has a new 200 megapixel resolution. Clearly 108 megapixels last year was just not enough. And now with pixel binning, which combines 16 pixels into one, we end up with a sharper and less noisy 12 megapixel file photo. But yes, you can shoot in the full resolution if you really want to, but I wouldn't recommend it as you'll miss out on a lot of the processing and the pixel binning benefits. Only if for some reason you want to print out a massive canvas photo or something. But don't get too wrapped up in that 200 megapixel headline. The real story is the new ISOCELL HP2 sensor and also the software, the processing behind the scenes that's gonna make a big difference. And also the physical layout of the camera, including how the electrons and neutrons are captured has been flipped from horizontal to vertical. Altogether means it can capture more light, we get less shutter lag and also faster autofocus, particularly in tricky lighting. I'll do a proper deep dive in my full review, and of course, all the camera comparisons you could shake a stick at, but Samsung this year are putting a lot of focus on, uh, and I hate this word, nightography, you know, low light photos and videos. And even here, with me just filming the phone off screen, you can see that shooting video in this dimly lit kitchen, just how bright and detailed it looks on the S23 Ultra. Also zooming in, it's kind of hard to tell with this off-screen footage, but in person I could see a noticeable difference in the detail and also how much more natural skin tones were, something I have criticized Galaxy phones for in the past. The ultrawide continues to double as a macro, which now actually has a shorter focal length so you can get even closer to your subjects, and video now tops out with 8K at 30 frames per second, up from 24. There's also a brand new astrophotography mode, which I didn't get a chance to try out. I'm also keen to spend more time with the selfie camera because as I say, all three S23s have the same 12 megapixel dual pixel autofocus selfie camera, which is a bump up from the 10 megapixel S22 and plus, but on paper, a step down from last year's Ultra, which had 40 megapixels. Again though, this year seems to be all about that processing, and Samsung promised that all these camera smarts and upgrades will also be available in third-party camera apps like Instagram, TikTok, and Snap, but really if you're a bit more of a keen photographer or videographer, then you want to use the Expert Raw app, which has also been updated, it's free from the Galaxy App Store, and that really is the best way to get the most out of the camera. I also really appreciate we get four years of Android updates with Samsung phones, and of course the S23 runs the latest One UI 5.1 on top of Android 13, which introduces a couple of new mode and routine options which I'll play with, but there's nothing significantly new here. No complaints though, it's still fast, there's an absolute ton of features from the sidebar to Windows Link to Dex to all the S Pen extras. So all that sounds very exciting, but the S23 Ultra is very expensive, as you'd expect. And actually, while the price hasn't technically gone up because they phased out the entry level 128 gig version and now you have to start at 256, which I think actually is the spec you'd want and also comes with 12 gigs of RAM as standard, it is now more expensive starting at 1249 pounds. Although here in the UK at least, for the same storage, that's actually 60 pounds cheaper than the iPhone 14 Pro Max. But don't forget, there is a lot of strong competition out there. You've got the regular S23s, and I think the Plus may actually end up being the best choice. But we've also got the OnePlus 11, the Pixel 7 Pro, the Vivo X90 Pro, the Xiaomi 13 series, and dare I say, even the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max. So, what do you reckon? Tempted to upgrade? Or not really? Let me know what you make of this in the comments below. If you've got any questions for my full review and big comparisons, which are coming very soon, also let me know. And I'll see you next time right here on the Tech Chat. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe.